you're going to go live in three, two, one. Hi there, good evening. Uh, it's James Harper here at uh, Get Ahead in English. We're going to do another poetry masterclass this week, and it's going to be on my favourite poem of all time, uh, My Last Duchess by Robert Browning. Um, and you will hear me talk about this poem in lots and lots of detail um, and show you why it's so brilliant. And it will hopefully take um, somewhere between 15 minutes and an hour um, and you'll get lots from it, hopefully just for pleasure, but also for uh, GCSE. Um, this is an AQA GCSE parent conflict poem. I think it's also in some of the other exam board clusters as well. And it's also a good poem for A-level too. Um, so hopefully you'll enjoy this. Um, I will enjoy speaking about it. Um, if you're watching this live um, and you have any questions or comments, then ideally just ping them through on the Q&A. Um, and we'll have those fielded to me at various points within the hour. Um, if not, just sit back and listen, take notes as you wish. One of the things that I would advise, like last week for the prelude, is to have a copy of the poem with you so you can make annotations and notes. Otherwise, um, you won't be able to retain them so easily. All right, so I'm James Harper, Head of English at West Somerset College, teaching 13 to 19 year olds. Um, and this is a pleasure to be running um, on this lovely Wednesday evening. So we're going to talk about the poem in lots of detail. Um, we're also going to be looking at the painting, in particular the, the Bronzino painting on the right in a bit more detail. Um, that there on the left is a portrait of the Duke. Um, these are real people um, and although Browning certainly has played with the facts um, of what happened. It is based in reality. So this is one of those poems where you could, where context, historical context is interesting um, and applicable. Um, and I'll do a little bit of that right now at the start. So grab yourself a copy of the poem if you haven't already, press pause um, and then come back to the video when you're ready. So I'd like to do a little bit about the poet first before we start. Robert Browning is um, one of my favourite poets, certainly very accessible, but um, writes these brilliant monologues in which we get to explore um, a variety of different characters, many of whom are rather unpleasant or sleazy or have um, hidden motives for things. Um, and you know, we're kind of drawn, I think the Victorian era certainly were drawn to stories like those. Um, and some of them, like this one, retreat into the past. So they are stories from the 16th century or the 15th century, um, very much like Shakespeare, for example, did for Macbeth um, and based a, a story from the 11th century in his day. There's a picture there on the screen of um, the town of Pisa, most famous for a leaning tower. I avoided um, putting the leaning tower on. Um, because I just wanted to frame how beautiful um, Pisa is more generally. Um, and you'll see why, why I put that on in a moment. So Browning was born in London in 1812. His father, um, who was a real inspiration for him, was a rare book collector. He had well over 6,000 volumes, including many works in translation. And Browning himself bounced in and out of school. He wasn't education, formal education wasn't for him, um, but he was very well read. Um, as one would expect if your dad has um, 6,000 really kind of interesting and weighty books. Um, he read, read from fluently from age five um, and written his first volume of poetry at 12, although it wasn't published. Um, subsequently, um, in his early 20s, he was. Um, and by 1833, um, he'd also published plays as well uh, as poetry. Um, at the time, Browning wasn't particularly well known. And in 1846, when he met, met and married Elizabeth Barrett, um, she was by far the more well known of the two. Um, so in 1846, they moved together to Italy, um, a place they were both fascinated by. Browning was never especially well known, as I've said, for much of his lifetime, but he started to receive acclaim shortly before his death in 1889, as is typically the way for great poets, they tend to be discovered um, close to their death and then revered after they've died. And that's pretty much true for Robert Browning. Not sure you would have studied Robert Browning at school, for example, when he was still alive. 
So a little bit about the poem before we do line by line stuff. So I really strongly recommend you grabbing a copy of the poem now if you haven't already. My Last Duchess is generally accepted to be based on the real life 16th century Duke of Ferrara. Um, I think the Ileste family, um, who in 1558 married Lucrezia de Cosimo de Medici. She was the daughter of the Grand Duke of Tuscany. Um, and the de Medici family you might have heard of, they um, were incredibly powerful and wealthy, um, but their money was new money. Their money um, was accrued from increasing kind of mercantile trades and things like that. Um, so they weren't um, the aristocracy. They were those who had kind of built their way up, moved their way up. Think about Mr. Burling, maybe, rather than... Um, about kind of Lady, Lord and Lady Croft, perhaps, if you want to look at it that way. Um, at the time that the Duke and the Duchess married, he was 24 and she was 13 years old. Um, and this doesn't sit very easily with students and nor should it. Um, but I'll come to some of those issues, um, if you don't mind, later on in the discussion around the poem. But that, that age gap probably wouldn't have been all that uncommon in those days. Um, and for a teenage or young teenage girl here being betrothed to an older man um, was almost a kind of a, a business deal rather than any kind of romantic or sexual relationship. Um, so I think the poem will allow us to explore those ideas. So the Medici family, the Medici family officially was wealthy, well known, but they came from new money, also known as the Nouveau Riche. Um, whereas the Duke of Ferrara's family was venerable and distinguished. Um, you know, this idea of being a Duke, um, the Lucretia's father, the Grand Duke, was a was a title that was um, invested to him by the people of Tuscany. It wasn't something that he'd inherited. Um, whereas being the Duke of Ferraro is something, although it sounds less grand than the Grand Duke, um, was actually the more important title. So hopefully there's some interesting things here for you to add to your understanding. If you haven't read the poem before, um, then you might benefit from just a little overview. Um, I'm not assuming that anyone knows the poem at this point. In the poem, the Duke gives the messenger of the family of his prospective new wife a guided tour of his castle um, and reveals the painting of the late Duchess. That's quite complicated the way I've written that. So effectively, we have a speaker, the Duke. All right. Um, he was previously married to the lady you see on the screen, the um, Lucretia, um, the girl, I should say, really. Um, that marriage having ended, presumably with her death, um, meant that he now was looking for a new wife um, and the Count, who is the father of the new prospective wife, has a messenger, an emissary um, or an envoy who is his, his kind of business associate, his, his assist, business assistant, if you like. And that's the man who's being talked to in the poem by the Duke. So this particular painting, he, he reveals to the envoy or the messenger. I will use the word messenger just to keep things consistent. Um, and he keeps the painting hidden, um, almost like a form of control over her behind a curtain. Not only behind a curtain, but also upstairs in a, a hallway on a wall, perhaps slightly out of the way. Um, he mistrusted this uh, girl, believed that she had no respect for his 900 year old name. So hopefully that's clear enough so far. And then the poem reveals slowly um, and but pretty decisively that he gave orders to have her killed. Or, I mean, we could argue that perhaps in those days it would have been typical in this situation to have had her removed to a convent. Um, we can maybe, if we have time, argue those points. But that's not really the point of the poem. What happens to the Duchess? She doesn't um, in a way survive this marriage. This marriage brings about a, a, a point in her life that is irreversible. A few things about form. So form is just a, a way of describing 
um, the way the poem is written or any kind of genre characteristics or types that the poem um, inhabits. So you might have heard of the term dramatic monologue. So this poem is a dramatic monologue. Browning was the master of them. You should go and read some of his other poems. Porphyry's Love of the Laboratory, a very famous Fralipo Lippi, my favourite. So a dramatic monologue is performative, meaning it is dramatic. It is best read and listened to um, with, a, with a sense of performance. So I will probably very badly read it for you in a moment. Um, but also a dramatic monologue tends to have a listener as well as a speaker. So yeah, monologue means one speaker, um, but there is always another listener, silence, not responding. In this case, the listener is very important to our reading of the poem. So the listener is somebody of a lower class, um, still important and probably quite wealthy, but he is the emissary, the messenger for this new duchess, potential duchess. Um, so he is somebody who has been assigned by a count here um, who is uh, important and wealthy in his own right um, to look after the business affairs of his daughter before she is married off um, to this duke. The poem is written in one long stanza, 28 rhyming couplets of iambic pentameter, 56 lines. It feels quite long at first reading or at first glance, but the better you know it, the more you realise that every word counts. Um, and it's, it's, it's important that, that we understand the poem in that way. Um, it's written in rhyming couplets as well, which is, is something else that you might miss on first reading because you don't always hear the rhyme. Um, but every line rhymes with the next line and so on. Um, it's also written in iambic pentameter. And um, I'm sure your teachers have taught you about iambic pentameter, but five, unstressed then stressed syllables which goes to tum to tum to tum to tum to tum you don't always hear it quite as um, expressively as that in the reading but we go unstressed stressed throughout five times um, to make ten syllables and the form of the dramatic monologue as well is important because if you're writing about the poem it's it's not it, the fact that he's given um the privilege if you like of speaking without anyone interrupting him um means that what he omits what he chooses to say and the way that he speaks um is of utmost importance as is the directions as well that he gives the messenger um as he talks and introduces the poem the painting sorry so this this poem is a classic case of showing not telling i'm sure your teachers way back probably into year three and four were telling you when you wrote stories that you should show and not tell um so you know you don't you don't tell somebody um that i'm a raging psychopath um and um you mustn't trust me and blah 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 which is, or a narcissist which is clearly what this guy is um instead you show and you the more subtly that you do it i guess the more interesting the poem is for us to 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 tackle it's not like a code we have to unlock but there is something here of a kind of a, almost like a psychological case study this is a man who is deeply deeply troubled and troubling and because he has such power and wealth and prestige that's dangerous this is narcissism meaning to love oneself He's powerful. He's a member of the Italian aristocracy. And the insights we get into that power is what makes the poem fascinating. And in a sense, sure, we feel sorry for the Duchess who is killed here. And I'm going to assume she's killed for most of the, uh, the lecture. Um, but actually, it's not really her story. It's more his story. Um, and for modern readers, when we're talking very much more about equality between the sexes, um, and feminist um, critics would, would want to explore the silencing of um, this female figure. OK, so I think if I press enter now, I'm going to move to a reading of the poem. So I'll clear my throat and get ready to read the poem. Um, it's My Last Duchess. That's my last duchess painted on the wall, looking as if she were alive. 
I call that piece a wonder now. Fra Pandolf's hands worked busily a day, and there she stands. Would it please you, Sid, and look at her? I said Fra Pandolf by design, for never read strangers like you that pictured countenance, the depth and passion of its earnest glance, but to myself they turned, since none puts by the curtain I have drawn for you but I, and seemed as they would ask me, if they durst, how such a glance came there. So not the first are you to turn and ask thus. Sir, t'was not her husband's presence only called that spot of joy into the Duchess's cheek. Perhaps Fra Pandolf chanced to say, her mantle laps over my lady's wrist too much, or paint must never hope to reproduce the faint half flush that dies along her throat. Such stuff was courtesy, she thought, and cause enough for calling up that spot of joy. She had a heart, how shall I say, too soon made glad, too easily impressed. She liked what air she looked on, and her looks went everywhere. Sir, twas all one. My favour at her breast, the dropping of the daylight in the west. The bough of cherries some officious fool broke in the orchard for her. The white mule she rode with round the terrace. All and each would draw from her alike the approving speech, or blush, at least. She thanked men. Good, but thanked somehow, I know not how, as if she ranked my gift of a nine hundred years old name with anybody's gift. <laughs> Who'd stoop to blame this sort of trifling? Even had you skill in speech, which I have not, to make your will quite clear to such a one and say, just this or that in you disgusts me. Here you miss or there exceed the mark. And if she let herself be lessened so, nor plainly set her wits to yours, forsooth, and made excuse, e'en then would be some stooping. And I choose never to stoop. Oh, sir, she smiled, no doubt. Whene'er I passed her, but who passed without much the same smile? This grew, I gave commands, then all smiles stopped together. There she stands, as if alive. Would it please you rise? We'll meet the company below, then. I repeat, that the Count your master's no munificence is ample warrant that no just pretense of mine for dowry will be disallowed. Though his fair daughter's self, as I avowed at starting, is my object. Nay, we'll go down together, sir. Notice Neptune, though, taming a seahorse, thought a rarity, which Klaus of Innsbruck cast in bronze for me. Great fun reading that. Quite nasty, quite chilling poem, but what a voice. What a voice is created. So I'm going to do what I did last time for the prelude. Do watch that video if you find this one useful. Um, and go through the poem, not forensically line by line. We don't have time for that. I could spend three or four hours with this one. But I want to take the most interesting points, some of which I'm sure you will have been taught, others of which might be food for thought, um, and give you a, a real feel for, for how this poem operates. So I'll take the poem in sections, um, and I've split the poem um, into effectively into four lines per slide, but it doesn't work very well for this uh, for teaching because the enjambments. Um, and the phrasing often spill out, allow it to spill over. Anyway, you'll see how I do this. So the first thing we get at the start of the poem, which I didn't include on those slides, is an epigraph or a, an opening um, of simply the city in Italy in which um, the poem is located. And it gives it an air of realism. We're in Ferrara. 
um, which certainly back in the day in the Renaissance era would have been a really important place. I think in Emilia Romagna. Um, and so the, the, the general setting, uh, Browning doesn't want people to think that this is um, perhaps uh, based on a, a figure of from British history, um, although it could quite easily be. Um, that this is a figure from Italian history and he's interested in the power and the wealth of Italy in the Renaissance era. And of course, we've already heard he's a bit of an Italophile. He loves Italy um, and lived for many years there. The setting is important in the poem within the confines of the home as well. They're yeah, called the Duke's home, his castle. It may not have been described as such at the time, but um, this is going to be a big building um, that has its own courtyard and terrace and grounds. Um, and we're inside the Duke's home almost voyeuristically. We've come upstairs um, away from the main gathering downstairs as well. So this meeting between the Duke speaking to the um, the messenger is clandestine. It's not something that is out in the open. It's a secret private meeting. It's potentially an unwise meeting. Um, and we might argue later on that the Duke is unwise to tell the messenger what he is um, telling him. Or it might be used more strategically as all kind of warning. So we'll look at both potentials. So hopefully this is useful and relatively easy to understand at the moment. So let's start then at the very beginning here. <clears throat> if I take the poem sentence by sentence, it's probably the easiest way of doing it. I'll try and offer a, a simple translation as well. So that's my last duchess painted on the wall, looking as if she were alive. There's nothing particularly confusing there. Um, the first word, that's, is a pointing word. And there's a, there's a special term for that, which is deixis, which means to deliberately point to using language a, a specific place or time um, or object in this case so the duke points at the painting um, and uh, we as readers will kind of our eyes would be drawn in the same way to it as well look at uh, last duchess well, we will know that the, the the last duchess is effectively she, she almost certainly killed by the duke and his people um, there's going to be a new duchess, um, as we are made aware quite shortly as well. I think this is interesting. Painted on the wall is often ignored. And I think for me, um, I don't know if you disagree, you might disagree, but painted on the wall, you wouldn't say if it was in a frame, you wouldn't necessarily say that it's painted on the wall. You'd say that's my last duchess in a frame on the wall. It doesn't sound as poetic, perhaps, but um, what this might then suggest is that actually the the artwork here is a fresco, that it's that her image is painted directly onto um, the stone, perhaps, of, of the wall. Um, again, a sense of permanency, even if you don't buy that painted on the wall sounds as if it's is there to, to stay and um, looking as as if she were alive. Well, we will know. Um, that she no longer is. I call that piece a wonder now. And this is the beginning of our understanding that the Duke is not only this narcissist, but he's also a lover of art. He's a collector. Um, that's what a lot of people with loads of money do these days is collect art, don't they? Because it tends to keep value um, and increase in value in ways that other things might depreciate. Um, but I mean, by all accounts, he, he admires the, the artworks that he has around him. And this one he calls a wonder now. Perhaps not at the time it was painted, however. Then we've gotten the name dropping of the painter. Now, Fra means brother. And in those days, you would have had um, the majority of, of portrait artists would have been monks, would have been um, men of the church. So Fra Pandolf is presumably somebody who might be well known as far as I'm aware. It's a fictional name. Um, 
But look, we're told that Fra Pandolf painting the Duke, the Duchess, his hands worked busily a day. That's an example of what's called synecdoche, where we take one part of a being um, or an object or a place um, and we give it, make it the whole. Um, so here, he's not interested in the rest of Fra Pandolf because he's a painter, not really interested in anything other than his hands. His hands worked busily a day. Um, and there she stands. There aren't um, many end stop lines. By lines, I mean the line of poetry um, in the whole poem. So having an end stop line um, in the poem gives us a longer pause. If you look, there's a there's a full stop in the second line as well. That's my last Duchess painted on the wall, looking as if she were alive. I call the 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 line um, kind of the caesura there means that the line carries on much quicker than it might do if you have a full stop at the end of a line. And that's my thought there. It allows us to just stop, pause, have a look at the painting. I know that we can't see it in words, um, but we're kind of mimicking maybe the process of which um, the messenger experiences this painting. And then it feels very polite. Hey, this is a messenger. This is somebody who's beneath the Duke, um, but he feels like he, he's flattering him. Um, Would it please you sit and look at her? He says very, very kind of genteel um, and mannerly. Um, why does he speak like this? It's also performative. Um, we use that word a few times in this session because a dramatic monologue isn't just hear my thoughts, blah, you know, blurt it all out, stream of consciousness. There's there tends to be a sense of performance here about it too. Other there are other dramatic monologues in the uh, anthology for power and conflict. Remains, for example, I would cast as a dramatic monologue. It doesn't have quite the performative um, moments that this one does, um, but there are aspects that uh, are satisfying to kind of read aloud and perform. But this one is clear what's going on. They're both standing, probably the messenger rather awkwardly. And there's um, presumably there's been a, there's a bench that's been installed. I don't want to sit on the floor and look at it. Um, so this artwork that has been produced has, you know, we've had a bench that, that, that this has taken. This is a focus or was a focus. <clears throat> and he drops the name of the painter again. And he says, by design, I said Fra Pandolf by design, meaning on purpose. The painter therefore must be well respected and has captured something of the Duchess that only master painters can achieve. And what expression is it that's on her face? <clears throat> he says, never read strangers like you that pictured countenance. You would never have been able to um, read this um expression without asking somebody what she was thinking now this complicated but not that complicated the depth and passion of its earnest glance gives us a clue so <clears throat> the tradition at the time would be particularly for women who were sitting for portraits would be they would be very pale um because pale was considered to be attractive um, and they wouldn't smile. In fact, they would purse their lips and they would um, it would almost be a frown. That's why the Mona Lisa is considered such a rogue and famous painting, because there's that smile. What is she smiling at? And here we've got that in the um, in the description. What is it that she's smiling at? It's alluring. There's a little bit of an opposite going on here with depth and passion. And earnest, earnest means serious, but depth and passion suggests that the seriousness is is kind of emotive, maybe rather than um, something that is scholarly um, or kind of faced. So it seems like the painting represents or presents the Duchess to be um, perhaps flirtatious, perhaps she is. Um, has been allured or or interested in. She's looking at something that takes her interest or amusement. 
I also say that beginning with uh, I said, the sentence is very, very long and complex as well. It does. It's a sort of poem that on first reading probably will confuse many, many people, myself included. It's been so long since I read it first time. But this is a poem that, that has tricky sentences in it. He's, the Duke, though, has real mastery over his language. Um, and he's mostly very careful with his words, perhaps once or twice slips. Um, and that's when the cover is blown, when it's the poem is that it's most interesting. Anyway, she looks like she's smiling or she's blushing um, or there's something about her that is unusual. <coughs> and the Duke thinks everyone thinks this. Well, of course they would, I suppose, if this is so strange for the era. Why is she smiling? To myself they turned. Suggests that people are interested. Um, could this be paranoid, though? Is he seeing something that others don't see? And then there's this really chilling bit in brackets or parenthesis. <laughs> so it's almost as an aside as he turns to the Duchess and says behind almost behind his hand like an aside in a play since none puts by the curtain i have drawn for you but i chilling control um and also a revelation now that he's with removed the curtain it reminds me of um prisoners or or people that are kept in solitary confinement and are shut away um <clears throat> of course she's dead and she may well be better off dead to be honest um, but behind that curtain we have the portrait and by revealing it and closing it and revealing it and closing it he has this form of control over her life even in death anyway it seemed as they would ask me if they durst durst important here an old-fashioned form of the word dare so would anyone have dared to ask him how such a glance came there what is that um, glance? How did that come here? What was she looking at? Who was she smiling at? Well, the first obvious thing she might have been smiling at if she was having a portrait taken would be the painter, Fra Pandolf. If you know anything about monks, they take a vow of celibacy um, and are not interested in the slightest bit, um, or shouldn't be, um, of anyone of the opposite sex. Um, and indeed, monks are known to be rather grave and serious but um although a lot of the monks actually in robert browning's other poems tend to be drunk and disorderly but there you go but this one here is another maybe aspect of paranoia we've got going on um he says browning continues so not the first are you to turn and ask thus now i don't hear the envoy the me messenger sorry interrupting this conversation saying why does she look like that maybe he look his expression gives it away or maybe it's just the paranoia again of the duke the duke believes that people are interested in how the expression came to be there uh, but the messenger is silent he doesn't ask anything Continuing, so it was not her husband's presence only called that spot of joy into the Duchess's cheek. And we're getting to the heart now of the matter. <clears throat> Is there, I put the word jealousy on the slide, but now I question myself a little bit. I always read different things into this poem every time. Is jealousy, this does become apparent, but is jealousy the wrong word? She, he wants her only to smile for him. Right. Otherwise, I'm guessing what he wants is for her to walk around and look down at the floor. Um, he wants her to only smile for him. So is this jealousy or is it disgust or shame or embarrassment on his part? Does he feel um, as if he's not being knocked back or disrespected? It's horrible, isn't it? It's toxic. All she's doing is smiling. And then a euphemism, the first, we've got loads of euphemisms in the poem. A euphemism is something 
Well, another phrase used to describe something um, that might be a bit crude or rude or coarse or blunt in this case, she blushes. Um, it wasn't only her husband that called that spot of joy into the Duchess's cheek, that blush, that smile. Um, spot of joy. Spot of joy could be a reddening of the cheeks, couldn't it? That would be very unusual for a portrait too. Or it could be a dimple or something, you know, as as one smiles. And then he then he starts to think about what the painter might have said that caused that spot of joy to come to her cheek in the painting. He says, perhaps Fra Pandolf chance to say her mantle. Her mantle is a cloak or a shawl. <clears throat> Sorry, my voice is croaking. Her mantle, ooh, oh sorry, I had the extra, extra notes there, um, that this very long sentence, the third sentence, ends there on that full stop, um, and that pause is significant, I think. Anyway, her mantle, her cloak, laps over my lady's wrist too much. That seems really innocuous, doesn't it? It seems like quite an innocent thing. She's wearing a shawl or a cloak called a mantle, and it's just kind of lapping over her wrist. Maybe the, she, he imagines that the painter might gently move that shawl back over her arm slightly. Perhaps that's why she blushes. That contact, that physical contact. Imagine like a photographer photographing a model. You, you, you sense that this kind of that's an important relationship for a short time where the photographer has to position his or her model in the way that uh, that is appropriate. Or paint must never hope to reproduce the faint half flush that dies along her throat. Now, this speculation is interesting because it includes reference, obviously, again to um, the half flush. You know, one's it does not always one's cheeks that flush when you're embarrassed or when you're in love. It can also be your neck. And that's what's being alluded to here. But there's also references to dying along her throat, which in the context of the poem might suggest something more sinister. Strangulation, maybe, or the slitting of one's throat. And that is not that daft an idea in the context of the poem. Perhaps he's giving things away. His language certainly there becomes much more elaborate. Anyway, for me, this is the really great word for you to use in an exam here is ventriloquism, because, I mean, in a way, Browning is a ventriloquist throughout the whole poem because he's voicing the Duke as if it were him, uh, were a, 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 a real character that, that, that he's kind of puppeteering. Um, but also we get the sense of the Duke ventriloquizing the um, painter, but he was never there. These are, this is all guesswork. Paranoia, jealousy, such stuff was courtesy, she thought, and cause enough for calling up that spot of joy, back to that spot of joy again. It feels to me like the Duchess simply smiles and is happy. She's if we take the story to be true, she's what, 13, 14, 15, and she dies age 16 in real life. Um, and, you know, she's a young girl who is happy with life. Maybe she's not all that happy at all um, with the Duke. It doesn't sound like you would be, but maybe her smiling at other things is almost a compensation for the misery that she has to endure with him. Um, it feels like the word courtesy is interesting because courtesy means manners, doesn't it? It means to do the right thing, to be polite um, and to smile does seem like courtesy. Maybe it's genuine. Um, she had a heart. How shall I say? Look at that bit. How shall I say between the two bra uh, dashes? How shall I say? As if he's hesitating, making sure he chooses his words carefully. To me, it seems like it's all fairly well rehearsed. Um, she had a heart, how shall I say, too soon made glad, too easily impressed. Does this feel euphemistic to you as well? What is he accusing her of? 
one might think that he's accusing her of being unfaithful um, or committing an act of infidelity, um, that she's hooking up with the gardener or with somebody else who works at the house. But that isn't at all hinted at in the poem. That's our reading. If it's just that she's happy, that she's too soon made glad, too easily impressed, there's no crime being committed here at all. She's just joyful. She's a happy person. Too soon made glad, too easily impressed might hint at her being a little maybe on the simple side, that she's not got a lot of intellect. Um, but actually, later on in the poem, the Duke contradicts that. Anyway, she's not committing any sort of crime here at all. She liked what air she looked on and her looks went everywhere. See how her looks went everywhere is another form of euphemism. Um, the Duke suggesting, or maybe it's not euphemistic. You know, is she flirting? Is she committing infidelity? There's no evidence for that. Um, her looks went everywhere might just mean she's interested in everything around her. And all he wants is for the respect and to kind of get back in her box um, and, you know, accept that she's become a duchess and that should be, she should be grateful for that. Sir, t'was all one. There's the shortest sentence in the whole poem. Sir, t'was all one. Back to using this sir with the messenger feels weird, but it was all one. I think that sums up the poem pretty nicely, uh, to be honest with you, in three words. Short exclamation. He thinks that he's been treated poorly by her, that he has been rejected or disrespected because everything else got the same sort of look. All right. And now we're going to start a list. All right, it's going to be a list of four things that she looks at. Let's see the things that he chooses to pick out that he feels either jealous or insecure about because she looks at them with admiration. My favour at her breast. So this isn't anything sexual. This is um, a favour like you would have at a wedding is a trinket or in, in the past it's normally been a piece of jewellery um, and if you look at the painting <clears throat> and we'll look at the painting fight at the end of the session she's wearing a brooch at her breastplate and that is the favour here as far as I'm concerned so she smiled at that that represents him that's something he's bought for her perhaps as a as a wedding trinket um, and that is something that she wears and she likes. Great. Good for you. The dropping of the daylight in the West. Oh, as she also smiles at the sunset. Great. Are you jealous of the sunset? And we could talk about things like alliteration there, but the more interesting thing is just the bizarre way in which he's rattling off things that have made him feel insecure. This continues. The bough of cherries, some officious fool broke in the orchard for her. So presumably this is a gardener or a groundskeeper or some kind of servant, officious fool. Um, she said, can I have some cherries from that tree um, or from the orchard? And he's gone off and got some for her and brought them back and she's eaten them. Is the Duke jealous of that potential relationship? Is that flirtatious? Again, I don't think so. It's not really the officious fool um, that he is obsessed with here. It's the bow of cherries. And then finally, and this one's interesting, the white mule she rode with round the terrace. Now, I'd assume that perhaps this is a, a horse that she's brought with her. Now, a mule is not not a great animal, not an expensive animal, not an animal um, that anyone would um, particularly treasure. But a white mule is rare and a white mule is unusual and precious and would have been treasured in Italy. 
So there's a symbol of wealth here, but what I think is more interesting still is she rides with it around the terrace. She's trapped. She doesn't have anywhere to go. One might want to take that mule out into the fields, into the grounds. She's not even allowed there. She rides with it round the terrace, round and round and round the circumference of the house. She's trapped, it's claustrophobic. All and each would draw from her are like the approving speech, almost iambic there, you can hear it drawn out. The approving speech. What's the approving speech, do you think, that she's um, that she's giving all these things? Thank you, a smile, an acknowledgement. It's worth noting that the poem is in rhyming couplets, as you can see and hear. But you can't always hear them that clearly. But in this section, from breast, west, full mule, each speech, it's really strong. Um, the rhymes ring out. Um, it doesn't have quite as much caesura, um, and the effect of the enjambment isn't quite as profound because each line, if you like, feels like a separate point. And there, for me, that means that feels quite belittling. It's like he's putting her down. The tone of the poem becomes quite sing-songy and nursery rhymey. Um, so it's like he's patronising her. That's my reading of the way rhyme is used there. Go back. All and each would draw from her alike the approving speech or blush, at least. At least. A smile. Sure, a blush. Nothing to read into that. She thanked men. Is there anything unusual about smiling or thanking people? Good, but thanked, repeated here. Thanked is the approving speech. Somehow, I know not how, as if he ranked my gift, she ranked my gift of a 900 years old name with anybody's gift. So this is his real problem. This is his real grudge. She's happily smiling and thanking everyone, but they don't have his power. They don't have his prestige. And as a duke, he can provide her with that. What more could anyone want I've written? But, you know, hopefully that's rhetorical um, and you understand that this is a pretty awful, potentially awful life. The parenthesis here of I know not how, he seems to be getting more and more angry. I need to move on a little bit more quickly, so let's skip that for now. This is a, a, a an idea that's repeated two times later on. Who'd stoop to blame this sort of trifling? Trifling something silly. Trifling is something um, that's rather flimsy. Think of a custard jelly trifle, lovely, but those, those sorts of things are considered to be rather um, kind of flimsy or tacky and he thinks stooping to blame um, her for this would be lowering himself. He, then he says um, again directly to the messenger even had you skill in speech which I have not. Well that seems untrue. This is a man who's already demonstrated in the first two thirds of the poem that he has really good skill in speech. Is it humble? Is he trying to be humble? Is he trying to butter him up? What is it that he's trying to do here? Even had you skill in speech to make your will quite clear to such an one, old fashioned, but I always read a one there, and say, just this or that in you disgusts me. That word disgusts there stands out terribly, doesn't it? Disgust is pretty extreme. You look at that as a modern reader and you find that shocking. What she's doing disgusts him. If he sat down with her and was able to make himself clear and say to her, just this or that in you disgusts me. Here you miss or there exceed the mark. She either misses the mark and she doesn't do enough, or she exceeds the mark and she does too much. If she let herself be lessened so, to be taught, if she allowed herself to be taught, 
I hate that phrase. It's horribly patronizing, but also threatening. It's a father, um, like a punitive father to a daughter, isn't it? It's certainly not husband and wife. If she let herself be lessened so, nor plainly set her wits to yours. Look at that. She might have been a good listener and accepted what he had to say, or she might have set her wits to him. Does that imply that there's more to her than meets the eye, that she possibly would have fought back and made excuse? Even then would be some stooping, and I choose never to stoop. So we return to this idea of stooping. This is not a man who will lower himself. This is not a man who will stoop to her, her perceived level. Um, so she, she doesn't have that conversation with him. It's not granted to her. It's just this ball of rage in the duke. Um, and it ends badly. Oh, sir, she smiled, no doubt. Whene'er I passed her, but who passed without much the same smile? I mean, this idea of smile or spot of joy or blush has been repeated. I can't remember how many times by now in the poem, maybe 10. Um, and every time he talks about it again, it feels more and more ridiculous and more and more infantile, doesn't it? Right. It's like a, a, a jilted boyfriend or girlfriend seeing their partner um, hook up with somebody else and he's looking on. But I don't think there's anything here that's linked to romance or love. This is all to do with possession and power. So this idea of smiling being repeated constantly for emphasis, but feels ridiculous, patently ridiculous from a grown man. This grew. I gave commands, then all smiles stopped together. So this is the bit that most students remember the most readily. It's a tricolon and we can see that from the semicolons. So tricolon is just a posh way of saying a list of three. But it's slightly more than a list of three because there are three elements then that build in power. This grew, what grew? The smiling, sure. This grew, two syllables. One I am. I gave commands, two I ams. Then all smiles stopped together. Then all smiles stopped together. Maybe three and a half. <laughs> But these these three phrases grow um, and look at the pace in which he takes action. This grows. I gave commands and all smiles. So we spent 40, 45 lines describing what she's like. And then that's as quick as it gets. It's both factual and euphemistic. All smiles stop together. Strongly suggests he's had her killed. The, this bit the, the, is the heart, if you like, of the plot of the poem, but it's kind of knocked off in three very short phrases worth considering how he feels about that. Um, I don't think he had a great hand in it himself other than giving the order. And then there's there's something that I find darkly humorous here. There's a full stop. And then there she stands as if alive, which he's already pretty much said at the start of the poem. It's like he's pulled himself together and he's said too much. Um, or maybe the story's been done and now I'm warning you, um, we don't want the same thing to happen to your boss's daughter, do we? Will it please you rise? Uh, performative again, a reminder in We'll Meet the Company below that there's a business meeting going on downstairs and he's probably wanted. I mean, why why this encounter has happened in the first place is beyond me. Um, the Duke continues to flatter them, including the Count. I repeat, this bit's really complicated, so I'll skip over it quickly. The Count, your master's known munificence, is ample warrant that no just pretense of mine for dowry will be disallowed. The language here is very formal. This is somebody who's supposed to be not very good at speaking, 
but clearly he understands business and he understands the power play between families and maybe it's meant to obfuscate or cloud or confuse the messenger as to what he's just been told um and he's could could we uh, move on let's move on let's talk business now um basically to translate it the duke is willing to marry this new duchess because the dowry is generous he's going to be paid handsomely for her hand by the um woman's family and father um, but then adds in as an, as an afterthought a bit though his fair daughter's self as i avowed at starting is my object um so actually it's not about the money um i just want to marry the girl is my object could be dis could be seen there as objectification um it could be seen as dehumanizing but it's the goal it still feels a bit clinical and cold particularly in the context of everything we've already heard and this is the final part this is interesting nay as in no 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 we'll go together down sir why does he say that does he say that because the messenger's raring to go marching down the stairs to tell his boss that there's no way that he should be she should be marrying this guy I almost feel like that should be delivered with real power, maybe with a hand on his arm, a grip. Nay, we'll go together down, sir. It's performative. A reminder that this monologue has taken place away from the business of the day. The language is still deferential and polite, but is there a sense that the messenger is trying to break free? It's interesting to speculate about that. And then the final part of the poem is um, mentions another piece of artwork can't resist it um, and this artwork is a sculpture of the god of the sea neptune controlling a seahorse taming a seahorse thought a rarity and then name drops somebody again an invented sculptor klaus of innsbruck um, he's a collector um, of art and of objects and probably of wives as well he's a scary fella with a lot of power and wealth and desire to have control and we can finish perhaps on that final image it's, as well itself of a big brutish man that maybe he wants to be and maybe isn't but neptune taming a seahorse often associated with femininity um, and fragility and um, the contrast between the two might remind us of the relationship um, between Duke and Duchess here as well. But we finish on just looking back at the painting, having discussed the poem. I hope that you see how brilliant it is. There's so much going on. Every line matters. But this is that painting that was said to have inspired um, Browning to write the poem. We see the favour at her breast. It's being held there we don't see the maybe the mantle the mantle could be described as simply the frilly bit around her wrist um is that a smile it's certainly warmer and more smiley than many of the paintings i've seen of that time um is there a blush a little maybe around her neck maybe but whatever we've got here is portrait in words of the duke rather than the duchess so in a sense what we're looking at when we read the poem is the portrait of the duke and his narcissism and arguably his psychopathy um, rather than the duchess this is a tribute if, in a weird way to him rather than to her that's the bronzino Okay, I finished the session. Um, thank you for listening. We've gone right up to the hour mark. I hope it's been useful. It's probably all you'll ever need on the poem. Um, if you have any questions or comments, um, please feel, feel free to put them in Q&A, um, but we will wrap up. Um, go to the website to see further recordings and get the schedule of what's coming next. And I will see you next week for another Poetry Masterclass.